everybody and welcome back to Hoffman Reproductions. Good to be back with everybody here today. Finally, we are ready to begin our knife forging proce project, so thank you for your patience. We ran into the holidays and uh, New Year's Eve and everything, so we've had a bit of a delay, a little bit longer than I wanted to, but finally we are ready to begin. Uh, the type of knife that we're going to forge today is just a uh, small, simple patch knife. Nothing fancy, nothing elaborate. Something that would have been common on the American frontier for the 1700, 1780 time period, give or take. And in this process I'm going to take you through all the basics. Um, it's a relatively small knife but the same process can be applied to larger knives if you want to do something a little larger and we're just going to kind of cover as much as we can in uh, within the confines of each video. This will be several part series and show you the various steps. So, uh, to begin you're going to need a few things. You are obviously going to need some type of a forge. I have a uh, traditional coal forge with a hand crank blower but uh, propane works fine if you're set up for that. And to do just a basic knife you don't need a lot of tools. You do need some. You'll need obviously some type of tongs or pliers to get the steel in and out of the fire. You're going to need some type of a hammer. This is a cross peen. It's about a pound and a half, two pound hammer. That works good for most of your shaping. You can get a wide array of tools if uh, you're into a lot of different things, but for just basics, that works. You'll need some type of an anvil, of course. Um, I recommend eye protection because when you're forging, there's hot uh, flakes of metal that will occasionally fly off, hit your arm and burn it. That hits your eye and uh, you could very easily end up blind. So even though it's not traditional eye protection. Uh, if you do a lot of this, hearing protection, earplugs, um, hitting the anvil with the hammer, I forget what the decimal is that it releases, but it is damaging to hearing. So if you do this multiple times, uh, like I do, if you're making your living doing it, you will end up uh, depleting your hearing. You'll have hearing loss, so ear hearing protection. A uh, heavy set of welding gloves. I got some advice from a blacksmith a long time ago that told me you never want to wear gloves because it's a false sense of security. You'll pick things up that you shouldn't and you'll get burnt. Um, I believed that for quite a long while and I routinely burnt myself decided to put a pair of gloves on and quit burning myself. So I strongly recommend a pair of gloves. They'll save a lot of burns. Not that you're never going to get burnt uh, doing blacksmith work. Most likely you will at some point, but this will minimize the effects. So again, the type of knife that we're going to be making today is a small standard patch size knife. Uh, nothing fancy and we're going to be forging this out of 1084 tool steel. Uh, traditional tool steels that are comparable to what they had in the 18th century are 1070 you can get today, 1075, 1080, 1084, and 1095. And without confusing you too much, just basically what that means is that they're simple carbon tool steels. In other words, they're mainly comprised of various degrees of iron and carbon. Um, they're not like modern tool steels where there's alloys and chromiums and things mixed in there. It's just those two basic elements and it's comparable to what they had in the 18th century. It's superior in as much as the refining process today is a lot better than the 18th century but it, the, the makeup is basically the same which if you're after a historically correct piece uh, you're going to want to stick with those steels. If you've never done this before the lower carbon content, the 1070, the 1080 I would recommend that because it's a little more forgiving. In other words, you can be a little off with your hammering and your forging and your heat treating and not have as many problems. But if you up the carbon content, you have to be more careful with various things or you end up with problems. So what I've got here today, I believe this piece is 1084. Um, so to begin, we'll get on the uh, safety equipment here. And another thing, don't be afraid to pull your steel in and out of the fire to see what the uh, temperature is. It's kind of an old wives tale that the sage old blacksmith knew when to pull the metal out. You do kind of develop a feel for it, 
but even though I've forged hundreds and hundreds of blades, I still pull the steel out when I think it's getting close and check it. Don't be afraid to do that as often as you want, because if you burn high carbon tool steel, um, you will ruin it. That's a, something to bear in mind. You don't want to forge at too high of a temperature, kind of just a nice bright orange color, and you don't want to forge at too low a temperature into the reds, because if you forge at too low as a temperature, you're going to put um, stress fractures and crack in your blade. So uh, we'll cover that as we go on. But first thing, we're going to go ahead. I've got a little piece in here, and we're going to start heating it up. Okay, so we got that upper temperature. We're just going to start hammering on the cutting edge down, drawing this blade out, sort of like an elongated triangle. Traditional 18th century blades uh, have a two-way taper, most knives do, and it has one that tapers from the uh, back of the blade forward, sort of like an elongated triangle, and then also on the cutting edge, picture a piece of cheese. Uh, the spine of the blade or the back is going to be thicker and it tapers down to the cutting edge. If you have a big, heavy, thick cutting edge that doesn't have much taper in it either way, it's not going to cut very well. So it's important to put those two tapers in it, which I'll continually show you. But uh, again, you want to stop hitting on the blade when you're starting to lose color because you can put uh, stress fractures in there hitting tool steel that is too cold. So, back in the forge. And this process, of course, varies depending on what shape of a blade you want that you really can't describe is something you've almost got to just practice and get good at. There's various ways that you strike the steel, different angles that will produce uh, different shapes of the blade, all depending upon what you're trying to go for. hammering right out on the tip, again depending on what shape you want, but if you put the tip right out near the edge of the anvil and strike, you can really get that tip to draw out really nice, and uh, it will be a big help to you. The more you can do forging versus uh, spending time at the grinder or hand filing, it will really save you a lot of time. So it's good to get proficient with your, uh, your hammer and your anvil, and also you want to keep the hammer blows even. In other words, if I do half a dozen strikes on one side in a certain area, you want to flip it over and do the same thing on the opposite side. That's going to pay off when you start shaping and when you get set up for your heat treatment. If you have a lot of uneven hammer blows, if you're forging the steel at too high a temperature, too low a temperature, uh, you're really asking for trouble. So, it's again, it takes practice to get good at all those things, but it's just something to bear in mind as we go on. Okay, it's been about 5-10 uh, minutes here of forging. I've more or less got the blade shape I want, and what I'm going to do now is establish the tang area. This blade's going to have a 3 quarter inch long, uh, well, 3 quarter tang, a little bit longer than 3 quarters of an inch, in an antler handle. So what I'm going to do is pick a point on the steel where I want to fuller in for the tang. Uh, you can do that with a fullering tool or uh, what I'm going to do is just hold it up on the edge of the anvil and strike with my hammer and establish that area. So that'll be our next step. a little bit on the next heat. Okay, 
it's a little bit of a uh, cheating technique if you want to be traditional, but keeping control of the steel uh, can be a little difficult with a set of tongs or pliers. You can use vice grips. Um, that uh, makes it so you don't have to keep the blade firmly clamped with one hand, which can get uh, fatiguing as time goes on, so that is one little thing you can do if you're doing a larger knife blade and you're going to be forging for a while. Alright, so I've got the basic outline done of what I'm looking for as far as uh, drawing out the length of the blade. What I'm going to do now is forge in the bevels and again the spine is the thick portion and we want it to taper forward to the cutting edge so that uh, it's a good cutter. So I'm going to put it back in the forge and we'll get started on that. for you. I was used that to cut the tang portion off. One thing you may notice when forging the bevel into your blade is that steel tends to <coughs> want to curve upward when forging a knife when forging that bevel in. And the reason for that is the metal is thinner along the cutting edge if that's where the force of your blows is directed, that will generate an upward curve, which is good if you're doing something like a uh, butcher or a trade knife, something like that, but with certain knives you don't want that to happen. There's a few different ways you can overcome that problem. Um, some knife makers will take and put a reverse bend in the knife before they forge the bevel in, which is basically just putting the blade over the edge of the anvil and strike down so that it looks like a banana facing down, and as you forge that bevel in there as the blade straightens it will be the desired uh, proportions along the back and the straightness will naturally occur. If you don't want to do that um, just tempor or periodically flip the blade over on its spine and hammer along the cutting edge and that will drive it back down to flat. You need to be careful though that you don't strike too hard because you can indent your cutting edge, which is the reverse of what we're trying to do here. Some knife makers will take a piece of uh, firewood or baseball bat, and if they're going to straighten it, strike with a piece of wood, and that will minimize the damage on the cutting edge. So just uh, one little thing to be aware of. So I'm more or less happy with the basic shape of this blade now. It's more or less what I was going for. Uh, just a couple of things to be aware of. When you're forging in the tang, you really want to be careful not to strike that at too low a temperature. In other words, when the metal's cooling off. Because as you pack the uh, fibers and the grain of the steel, it will actually densify and it can be really really hard even if the blade's soft and annealed to get your holes drilled through there for your handle so you need to be really careful when forging your tang out to not forge it at too low a temperature so you can uh, avoid that problem so now that we've got our basic shape established what you need to do after you forge the knife blade is you need to take it through what's called thermocycles um, or normalizing and all it involves is heating the blade up to a orange color and letting it cool to air temperature and this allows the steel to relax and uh, any stress or strain that's been built up in the edge from the forging process you can alleviate a lot of that which is important again for the later on heat treat it also softens the steel so that we can work it. Uh, in the 18th century it's typically what I do they would forge a blade as close to possible to the finished shape um, a lot of modern knife makers you'll see them forge the blade fairly thick so that it leaves a lot of uh, room for error or if you've made a mistake or whatever you can grind it away. Traditionally they were forged close to finished shape because they didn't have power tools to work the steel down when they were done forging so the more you could do at the uh, anvil and the forge the easier you were going to make it on yourself. So I typically do that 
Um, if you're a beginner, you probably want to leave your dimensions a little strong everywhere. It does take practice to get good with your forge, but traditionally, forged as close to possible as finished shape, and that's uh, usually what I will do unless it's uh, something that's giving me fits. Maybe I'll out add a little extra meat here and there just to be on the safe side. So um, I'm going to go ahead and normalize this blade. Whoop, down it goes. That happens pretty much every time I forge something to drop, which is why I have a stone floor. But uh, I'm going to go ahead and normalize this. You want to do it three times, again, to alleviate any stress that's built up in the blade. So take care of that now. Okay, so we finished our normalizing, took the blade through three cycles and let it cool down to air. Also in between there, I straightened the blade a few places. There were a couple little crooked uh, areas on it. Uh, you want to make sure you do that before uh, the knife blade fully cools off if you're doing it with a hammer and anvil. You can also use a vise and a straightening jig, which I'll show on another video. Um, if it's a larger knife that's gone through a lot of forging, the next step is to anneal it, which that means to heat it up to a bright orange color and bury it in wood ashes or uh, sand. This allows the blade to very slowly cool off and further leaves all the stress that's been built up. On a small knife like this where I haven't done that much forging on it generally I'll just do the normalizing procedure and that gets it soft enough, leaves enough of the stress you're good to go. But if it's anything larger than just a few inches I will go ahead and take it through that annealing cycle which I recommend you do. But at this point we're ready to put my maker's mark on it. Uh, in the 18th century most knives, not all, but most knives carried some type of a maker's mark. Uh, you didn't see names stamped on blades until later into the 19th century. And a maker's mark could be anything from, you know, a small flower or a letter or a specific shape. Each one was uh, individual to the maker and it just uh, set your work aside from another smith. So uh, I've chosen the traditional route of putting a maker's mark on as opposed to um, my name or anything like that. So I'll go ahead and demonstrate that here for you in just a minute. And typically you have to straighten the blade out just a little bit because that blow, especially if it's on a thin knife, will bend it just a little bit. Mm, that looks pretty good. Uh, there's been some debate about which side you should stamp a blade on that's replicating one from the 18th century. Um, for trade knives and such, a lot of people argue and say that it should be stamped on the left side because a lot of originals are. Um, I don't, however. I like to put mine on the right side. I always have. And I have seen some 18th century examples that carry it on the right side. So just again to set myself apart a little bit I stamp on the right side but that is entirely up to the maker and you can do whatever you prefer. So that's how we stamp the blade. Alright so this is the finished product of the knife that we just forged. I haven't touched it with a grinder or file anything straight out of the forge. Uh, we've normalized it. We've straightened a couple little kinks that were in it and we're now ready to grind in the profile and establish even further refine the cutting edge which we're going to do in our our next part part two but um, again you want to get the knife as close to finished state as possible uh, if you're doing it in the traditional manner it cuts down on the time you have to spend on it especially if you're finishing this by hand with nothing but files that can be a lot of work if you've left a lot of bulk so I typically try to get it to uh, as close to a finished state as possible. But um, this is going to be several part series. Part one down, part two coming up, which we're going to try and get to here fairly quickly and not let as much time last as before. But once again, thank you everybody for tuning in with us today. Thank you for your patience. If you're new to our channel, I'd like to invite you to uh, subscribe. That way you can get notifications to your email when new videos come up and are done. And uh, we'll look forward to continuing this project with the knife on down the road here a little while. Thanks so much again for tuning in, and uh, until next time, take care.